Osiris, it's ready, right? Amen. All right, everybody, we are finally at chapter 10. I'm going to move um, quickly to the part that takes longer. Remember that chapter 8, 9, and 10, if, if you remember anything from the study, remember that these three chapters, to better understand them, you have to read them, or you should read them, um, consecutively. Remember that the Bible is broken up the way that it's broken up. That was by man, so that we can easily digest it, but... The Lord didn't make chapter 8, 9, and 10, okay? Um, so that's, that's why sometimes when you want to understand what Scripture is saying, you got to read the chapter before, the chapter that you're studying, and the chapter after, amen? I'm going to do a quick um, recap of 8 and 9, but I'm going to read 8 and 9 because that's what we said we were going to do, and I want to keep to that. Um, remember that chapter 8, we, we learned that, um, oh, sorry, can you turn the music down just a little bit, please? Um, chapter 8 is in, that an idol, the summary of it, is an idol isn't anything of importance. Yet love is more important than knowing the idol does not have any significance. Especially when someone has the potential to stumble based on your level of knowledge of the spiritual realm and the things of the sort. The people of Corinth, some of them knew that there were no idols. I mean, that, that the idols didn't exist. So... That knowledge was making the lesser believer stumble. Love is the answer. Chapter 9. Uh, Paul gives up his right to be supported while preaching. And the reason why he did that is to highlight that others must give up their rights to show love to the weaker brother. Self-denial is the point being made in chapter 9. All right. I'm going to read um, 8 and 9 now. And, the, and 10 all together. Uh, be sensitive to conscience. So Cyrus, we're going to do this in, um, in the NLT, 8, 9, and 10. All of 8, all of 9, and all of 10 in the NLT. I read this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now concerning the things offered to idols, we all know that we have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating and the things offered to idols, we know that anything, uh, excuse me, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. I forgot I was going to uh, read this in the NLT. Let me just stop and go to the NLT on my phone. Huh? Sorry. I don't like the NLT because it, it's, uh, it's a little too watered down, but it's good for the difficult um, topics. I'm going to read um, 8 again. Now, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. Yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Verse 4. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a God and that there is only one God. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat meat, food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods, as their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it, and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you, with your superior knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? 
So because of your superior knowledge, a weaker believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if, I, if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Does that make sense? He's basically saying, because you know the truth, doesn't mean you can do whatever you want because there could be a new believer in the church that doesn't know the truth and you can make him stumble. Chapter 9, Paul gives up his rights. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus Christ our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I'm not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. An apostle is someone who starts churches, who, who, who um, injects doctrine into a church, into a community. An apostle is also somebody who has seen Jesus Christ and has spent time with the Lord, has had a, 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 um, a visual encounter with the Lord. Chapter 3, uh, excuse me, verse 3. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? So what Paul is saying here as we go down chapter 9, he's saying I, am, I have rights and I'm letting go of those rights like you should go of your rights of eating whatever you want. Amen? So right now, so sometimes he doesn't really talk about food, but he talks about saying, I can do this, but I don't for the weaker person. He's giving a lot of examples for the same thing, self-denial. I'm going to read um, verse 3 again. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have a right to live in your homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do, as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? What soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion? Or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating and tread as it treads out its grain. Was God thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us so that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who, you, who preach to you, shouldn't we have even a greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than to be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. Paul is saying, I'd rather deny my rights so that nobody can say that I was living off of the congregation. Again, he's showing his self-denial. He's saying, I'm supposed to be fed and housed, not money, fed and housed by this congregation. But I'm not going to do that. The same way that I'm not going to do that is the same way that you shouldn't eat food offered to an idol. Even though you know that there's no other God, still don't do it because you're going to make a weaker brother stumble that doesn't know what you know. So this is 8, 9, and 10 is all about food, sacrifice to idols, and self-denial. Verse 13. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple, and those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. If I preach the good news to you, he's saying, then, then you should bless me for that with food. Yet I have never used any of these rights, and I am not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet, preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. What then is my pay? Is it, the uh, it is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. He's saying he has a right to charge 
which in a sense, I guess it could be finances, but in the context, this is all about food. I'm, I'm, I'm reasoning with the text and I believe that he's discussing it with food. Again, I'll repeat that. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. He's denying his rights. He wants the people to deny their rights to eat certain foods. Verse 19, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share in their weaknesses. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with the purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should, meaning denying food. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I, might, I myself might be disqualified. And then the chapter of the night, lessons from Israel's idolatry. Here's where it all makes sense, everything that we've done in the past two weeks. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by the cloud that moved ahead. Guys, I sent you an email, um, two or three emails with some images in it. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by, the, by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground, in the cloud and in the sea. All of them were baptized as followers of Moses. I'm going to stop. Instead of reading 10, I'm going to stop and we're going to just dissect it like we do um, every chapter. Here he's talking about the lessons from idolatry. This is what all, everything he's been talking about has been talking about idol worship. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, he's reminding them that the mistake that the ancestors made was in the wilderness long ago. The Israel's main problem, their number one problem, was that they constantly broke the first commandment. If you don't follow the first commandment, just forget it. Maybe, maybe other ones you can break or, or, or whatever. You can't, I'm not condoning that. I'm just saying the other ones are whatever. But if you are serving other gods, you've, you've missed the whole point of all of this. That's what Israel did. Um, you got the images, Osiris? Let's go with the... Let's go with the cloud and the fire. So this is in verse 1. These are images that... Why does it say easy worship in the back like that? Okay. It's okay. Um... It's like, it's like when your debit card doesn't work and everybody's in the store and you're like, no, I got money. Anyway, <laughs> you know how everybody laughs because you know what's up, man. You're like, I'll get another card. It must have, I, I got a new balance. Anyway, so this, this is true. Everything that we're going to talk about, Paul is talking to the people in the church of Corinth and he's reminding them of the ancestors. Okay, he's telling them, yo, remember that I idolatry, it wasn't, it was a problem for your father and your grandfather and your great grandfather. This image, I love this image because this image is where scripture says, I'm Osiris, you're gonna have to go um, back and forth from this image to the two verses in Exodus 13 and 14. Um, so whenever you have 13 up, now that we've seen the pillar of fire, um, show the pillar of cloud as well. So when the, when the nation of Israel, when they left Exodus, I mean, when they left Egypt through Exodus, go back to the one of fire, this was a pillar of fire. There were two million Israelite males 
represented. Remember, when, when that's why the Bible is usually referencing men, because the men were supposed to give the knowledge to the women. Where do you see that? Well, remember, Adam was supposed to wash Eve in the word. That's a standard that you see all the way through scripture. It goes the man, woman, and child. There were two million people, two million Israelites that were males. So really, there was roughly about four million calculating wives and children. They used to have this, this is called the Shekinah glory of God. Every night, they had this pillar of fire in the sky. Let me tell you something. You have to make a decision in your mind that you believe this. You can never enjoy the depths of Scripture if there's anything within you that goes, ah, just, I just can't buy it. This is true. It's in manuscripts, even outside of the Bible. They always shared what God did. It was like when we sit around and watch TV and watch football on Sundays, on, on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath, they would sit around and read scripture and read the Torah over and over and over. They would share these stories from their ancestors. This is true. And God did this so that they would have a light in the desert and have heat. Because in the desert, it's actually pretty cold at night. And then during the day, it was, it was um, extremely hot. So that was the purpose of the cloud, the pillar of cloud. But also the pillar of cloud was how they would move. When the pillar of cloud would move or the, the fire would move, they knew it's time to fold up the tents and it's time to move. Interestingly enough, the way that the, the tents are, are all set up, they're set up by tribes. And the tribe that's right in front of the tabernacle is the tribe of Judah. Anywhere in scripture where you see the word Judah, you can take out the word Judah and you can put in the word praise. Judah means praise. And I find it very interesting that Judah is the temple, is the tribe that's in front of the temple because that shows the importance of praise. Before you get into the temple of God, you got to go through the tribe of praise. So when Ju Jesus is the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of praise. That's why we worship and praise. Amen. So there's order to everything that God does. Nothing is just because. Nada es por casualidad. Amen. So now we saw the pillar of cloud, Osiris. And it's the same thing here. They're just walking with the ark. These are random photos that I pulled um, off of the internet. This is true. I can prove it that it's true because it's in scripture. Exodus 13. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire uh, or, the, or the pillar of fire by night for the people. Those are both verses. Okay. Now let's go to Exodus 14. Then Moses, okay, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, on the dry ground, on the dry ground. If the Bible says that, that God parted the sea to the point where it was dry, that's true. We say, man, I don't know. The thing is, is that you cannot, only, only things, only people of the spirit, the Bible says, can understand things of the spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's impossible for you to even reason that this is true. And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Put up the image. This is an image that I found online. This is, this is, who knows what it looked like because nobody was there where they could draw it per se. But we know the Red Sea. You can get on a plane right now and go to the Red Sea. Like this is true. This is the supernatural hand of God. And you're like, I don't, uh, I don't know. Then you know what? Then you believe COVID. Then you believe that Donald Trump. Then you believe Joe Biden. Then you believe in the political system. Then you believe the LGBTQ can teach your children. Like, if you don't believe this, then you're going to believe something. I'd rather believe this and let the chips fall where they may. I'd rather say, yo, God said he parted the Red Sea. God said he parted the Red Sea. We're so quick to believe, yo, what, what Pastor Rafael said, it didn't hit me until a day or two later, what he said in his sermon. When he said, 
We were made from dirt. And we worship dirt. And he didn't finish what he meant by that. And I'm glad that the Spirit didn't let him finish because that's the seed that he dropped in my head. And I, start, I just was thinking about it. And I said, it was days later. We, the dirt that we're worshiping are the stories and fables and traditions of man. Tom Brady goes to New England. And I, you know, the, the posts that have like 50,000 likes or whatever, I always like to click on those things and look in the comments. It's, it's hilarious. But they're like, oh my God. Oh, I forgot, I forgot to see the halftime show. Oh, I'm mad at NBC because they didn't even put his speech. That's when what he said in the sermon hit me. I said, yo, but who is Tom Brady? That we, we're like, we're, gl we're glorifying dirt. So either you believe that in, in Jay-Z or Drake or Beyonce or or. or, or, or Giselle Bunchen or all these, or, or listen, man, you're going to believe something. I want to believe this. I want to believe that that cloud that's all the way in the back is the pillar of cloud that's mentioned in Exodus 13, that, that the people led the way, that God supernaturally saved his people because God supernaturally saved me. So how can I believe that God supernaturally saved me, but then be like, man, I don't really know about the supernatural stuff here, but I believe in the supernatural stuff here. Either you do, either you do or you don't. That's why I don't even watch. I understand that Romans 13 says that the government belongs to the Lord. I get all of that. But I don't believe in the government over what I believe in God. When politicians say that they're going to make America great again, I don't see that in Scripture. I don't see that anything in the world is ever going to be great again. I see that Jesus Christ is coming down with fire in his eyes and he's coming with a sickle to take the wheat. That's what I see. This is true. This is true. This really happened. Like this really happened to the nation of Israel. And it says Moses stretched out his hand. This man was insecure over the sea. And the Lord God, um, he sent the sea to go back with the strong wind all night. They went on dry land. It wasn't like mud treading through the mud. They went on dry land. And when the enemy came behind them, he killed them because God is good. And everything he does is good. That's why the Bible says one of my favorite Bible verses. They're all my favorite Bible verses, by the way. But my favorite Bible verses says, Let God be true and every man a liar. That's saying, yo, I'd rather believe God and let the chips fall where they may than to believe you. Because we're so fickle. We're so fickle. We change with everything. One minute we're like, ah, Donald Trump, rah, rah, rah. The next minute we're like, he's the, he's the, next. you got more people in the church waiting for the second coming of Donald Trump than the second coming of Christ. People are like, oh man, when he comes back, he's going to fix everything. I don't see it. I don't see that things are going to get, I see my life is going to get better. I see that a believer's life is going to get better, but I don't see it. So when I hear the politicians talking about all this stuff, they go into space, and then the Bible says there's a firmament. You can't even go outside in space. They're putting all this money, and there's all these politicians. It doesn't make sense. Believe this. That's why Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. You cannot be like this, hot potato with the Lord. Like, I believe, I don't believe. I believe, I don't believe. God says, yo, I'd rather you not believe. I don't want you to be, uh, I'd rather you be cold and I'd rather you be hot. But lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. God says, get up out of the church and go live the life that you're living if you're going to be half speed. Amen? That's God's truth, man. This is God's truth. Let's keep going down the text. Verse 2. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized. When they went through the sea, remember, whatever happened in the Old Testament happened in the New Testament. So when they went in the cloud, verse 2 of, Corinthians, of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when they went in the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. That's an example of a baptism. They were baptized through Moses. What's Jesus? Jesus is like a Moses. That's why we get baptized. Verse 3, all of them ate of the spiritual food. Uh, Romans 6, 3, Osiris. All of them ate of the spiritual food and all of them drank the same spiritual water. Again, Paul is talking about food. Ate, 
talking about food. Nine, talking about food. Here we are again, talking about food. All of them ate the same spiritual food and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them and that rock was Christ. The same way that God saved, that Israel was baptized when they followed Moses through the Red Sea, is the same way that Israel partnered with Moses to be saved and is the same way in Romans 6, 3 and 4, it's, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, Or do you not know that as many of us were as we were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. This is a perfect example. Moses and the people getting baptized through the Red Sea is the perfect example of a type and shadow of the Old Testament to the New Testament with Jesus Christ and us getting baptized. Whatever is in the New Testament has to be in the Old Testament. Verse 3. Um, all of them ate the same spiritual food. And then we go to Exodus 16, 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Every day the nation of Israel... Like, sometimes I say, I don't know, man, that's a little tough. Like, you know, like, man, there's like manna falling from the sky, like bread. Okay. Don't things fall from the sky right now? Like this, have you ever seen a snowflake? I love when, when the snow, before it gets all muddy and the, they break up the, the, the cement in the street with the plows. When they're trying to make money, even though it's dry and they're still plowing. But they... When I see the snowflake fall, those big snowflakes, that's what I think of. I go, yo, the same way that that snowflake is falling from the sky is the same way that there was manna every day. God told them every day to take enough for the day. They were not allowed to take any to the next day. And he tested them. It says it right there. We just read it that he tested them to see if they were going to do what he said on on on. On, on Fridays, they had to take enough for two days because they couldn't work on the Shabbat. That's how significant it is that you can see the things in the Bible. If you look into the world, if you look into the world, you'll see the Bible. If you look into the Bible, you'll see the world. It's not like the Bible is like this isolated book that it just sits by itself. There's manuscripts that people have found. There's archaeologists that found the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found the book of Psalms buried under mud in the caves in the Dead Sea and they opened up the scrolls and it's almost word for word. Holy Spirit, open our eyes, please. This thing's far from the sky now. The Lord feeds them manna from the sky and Paul is telling them, he's reflecting on the ancestors and he says, all of them ate the spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Verse 5, yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Basically, what he's saying is, yo, you guys, you guys had God. You saw all these miracles. You saw all these signs, all these wonders, a huge flame in the sky every day. And they still complained to God. They still said they didn't want to be there. They said they wanted to go back to Egypt. They were complaining to Moses and they were like, yo, this stinks. But the reason why they were in the wilderness was because they were complaining so much. That's why in Numbers 11.1, 1, again, another favorite Bible verse, it says the Lord hates complaining. He's feeding you from the sky. He's blessing them. And they're still worshiping other idols. Verse 5, things that happen... The, these things happen as a warning to us so that we, not, we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and indulged in pagan revelry. In verse 7, we're going we're gonna to read something. I want you to understand. When the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and indulged in pagan worship, I don't know. I have a tough time believing that. It's a nightclub. Where do you think nightclubs came from? Where do you think parties came from? That's pagan worship. 
drinking. There's so many scriptures that I found in my time reading the word that talk about late night parties, late night revelries. It's, it, that's pagan worship. That's where we get that from. Prove it to me. Okay, here we go. Right here it says in verse 7, as the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. The Holy Spirit brought me to Ezekiel 8 and 9 out of reading a different book. And I want to show you how much, that's why the, the, the concept, um, all of chapter 8 and all of chapter 9. That's why um, you have to remember when you're like, man, why so many chapters about food? Why so many chapters about sacrificing to idols? That was their biggest sin. Was the idolatry was their biggest sin. That was the sin that caused so much destruction over the nation of Israel because they kept breaking that first commandment. You got to understand, I got two sons. I would be upset if I knew that they thought that somebody else was their dad. I'd be like, yo, bro, like, I'm the one paying child support up in here. Like, I take care of you. Those are my Jordans. You know what I'm saying? And I'm a man. I'm flesh. I'm a sinner saved by the Lord's grace. I can imagine Yahweh, the creator, the, the God of the earth, the God of everything. He looks at you, not you, as somebody else worshiping Buddha. Listen to this. I'm going to read these two chapters. I couldn't start... And I want to tell you something else. It's from Israel's idolatry. Take your time. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were play the app. Play the app. Play it. Just let it play. That's my new thing. I just let it play and things that I can't understand, I let it play in different versions. I kept listening 8, 9, and 10 over and over for the past three weeks. Just let it play in the background. Turn off the music. Turn off the worship music and just let, let what we're studying um, play in your ear so you can gain an insight to this. All right, so listen. So, so verse 7 says, as um, they celebrated all night with feasting and drinking and they indulged in, in pagan worship. I'm going to read to you um, Ezekiel, all of chapter 8, and then all of chapter 9. This is disgusting. What the nation of Israel did is so bad. On July 31st, in my 30th year, this is the, the prophet Ezekiel. He has a vision from God. On July 31st of my 30th year, while I was with the Judean exiles besides the Kebar River in Babylon, the heathens were opened and I saw visions of God. This happened during the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. The Lord gave this message to Ezekiel, son of Buzi, a priest beside the Kebar River in the land of the Babylonians. And he felt the hand of the Lord take hold of him. As I looked, I saw a great storm coming from the north driving before it a huge cloud that flashed with lightning and shone with brilliant light. There was fire inside the cloud and in the middle of the fire glowed something like gleaming amber. From the center of the cloud came four living beings that looked human, except that each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet had hooves like those of a calf and shone like burnished bronze. Verse 8. Under each of their four wings I could see human hands. So each of the four beings had four faces and four wings. This is a vision from the Lord. Then the wings of each living being touched the wings of the beings beside it. Each one moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. Each had a human face in the front of the face of a lion on the right side of an ox on the left side and the face of an eagle on the back. Each had two pairs of outstretched wings, one pair stretched out to touch the wings of the living beings either side of it and the other pair covered its body they went in whatever direction the spirit chose and they moved forward in any direction without turning around the living beings looked like bright coals of fire or brilliant torches and lightning seemed to flash back and forth among them and the living beings darted to and fro like flashes of lightning here we go as i looked at these beings i saw four wheels touching the ground beside them one wheel belonging to each the wheels sparkled as if made of beryl. All four wheels looked alike and were made the same. Each wheel had a second wheel turning crosswise within it. 
still the vision from God. The beings could move in any four directions they faced without turning as they moved. The rims of the four wheels were tall and frightening and they were covered um, with eyes all around. When the living beings moved, the wheels moved. When they moved forward, the wheels went up too. The spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. So wherever the spirit went, the wheels and the living beings also went. When the beings moved, the wheels moved. When the beings stopped, the wheels stopped. When the beings flew upward, the wheels rose up. For the spirit... Forgive me. Forgive me. Idolatry in the temple. On chapter 8. I made a mistake. I was reading chapter 1. Then on September 17th, during the sixth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, while the leaders of Judah were in my home, the sovereign Lord took a hold of me. Again, a vision. I saw a figure that appeared to be a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he looked like a burning flame. From the waist up, he looked like gleaming amber. He reached out to what seemed to be a hand and took me by the hair. Then the spirit lifted me up into the sky and transported me to Jerusalem in a vision. I was taken to the north gate of the inner courtyard of the temple where there is a large idol that was made that has made the Lord very jealous. Suddenly the glory of the God of Israel was there just as I had seen it before in the valley. Then the Lord said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked. And there to the north, beside the entrance of the gate near the altar, stood that idol. This is in the temple of God. In the temple of God. The temple that we, that, that we saw that was in the desert was remade, that was extremely large, a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars put into it. He says that he saw an idol inside that made the Lord jealous. There with Jezaniah, Je the son of Shaphan, in the center. Each of them held an incense burner from which a cloud of incense rose above their head. Then the Lord said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing with their idols in dark rooms? Then they are saying, The Lord doesn't see us. He has deserted our land. Then the Lord added, Come, and I will show you even more detestable sins. This is how bad idol worship was. So when you read in Corinthians, what we're studying tonight, 8, 9, and 10, you're like, what's the big deal with the idols? The nation of Israel, it was like me putting false gods in this church. That you go into my office one day, Eddie comes in after hours, and I'm there with the Buddha praying to that God. Like this was serious. He brought me to the north gate of the temple. He brought me to the north gate of the Lord's temple and some of the women were sitting there weeping for their God, lowercase g, Tammuz. As the men go, the women go. The men were idol worshiping, the women were idol worshiping. Have you seen this? He asked. But I will show you even more detestable sin than these. Then he brought me to the inner courtyard. The inner courtyard, that's the, one of the holiest places for the nation of Israel. And at the entrance of the sanctuary, between the entry room and the bronze altar, there were 25 men with their backs to the sanctuary of the Lord. They were facing east, bowing low to the ground, worshiping the sun. It's like they're inside of God's temple and Ezekiel comes in through, through the wall where God told him, and they're worshiping, burning incense on God's altar. It's like if you guys came in and you saw me with a Buddha statue here and you were just standing at the door and I didn't know you were there and I'm praying and I'm worshiping to a sun god. You see how significant this sin is of idolatry. It is so significant. I can picture all of this happening. They're worshiping the sun. What do people say now? That they worship the sun, moon, and the stars. They worship the zodiac sign. You see that this has been around forever. People that the, the, the pagans that they're like, oh, we're just um, soaking in uh, the, the sun. And, and because Mercury is in retrograde and Pluto. People believe that. People believe these things. I'm comfortable in believing what I'm reading because I'd rather choose this than to worship the celestial bodies that God created. Verse 17, he says, have you seen this son of man? He asked. 
Is it nothing to the people of Judah that they commit these detestable sins, leading the whole nation into violence? If the priests are worshiping false gods, the entire nation is thumbing their noses at me and provoking me to anger. Therefore, I will respond in fury. I will neither pity nor spare them. And though they cry for mercy, I will not listen. Told you that God doesn't listen to everybody's prayers. Chapter 9. Then the Lord thundered, Bring on the men appointed to punish the city. Bring them, uh, tell them to bring their weapons with them. Six men, soon, uh, six men soon appeared from the upper gate that faces north, each carrying a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man dressed in linen who carried a writer's case at his side. They all went into the temple courtyard and stood beside the bronze altar. Then the glory of God of Israel rose up between the cherubim where it had rested and moved to the entrance of the temple. And the Lord called to the man dressed in linen who was carrying the writer's case. And he said, walk through the streets of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of all who weep and sigh because of the detestable sins being committed in their city. God is saying there's people that are worshiping false gods and there's some that are not. We were talking about it this morning in, in, in the morning prayer. There's some people that are just going to miss all the moves of God. And there's some people that are weeping. They're weeping over this, this, um, this sin for the nation of Israel. Isaiah, uh, Osiris, Isaiah 5.11. Isaiah 5.11, look at what this says. Again, I'm highlighting the idol worship of the nation of Israel. So you can understand why Paul is saying, don't eat food, sacrifice to idols, because that's a doorway to what plagued you and your fathers. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, to stay up late at night, though they are inflamed with wine. Is that not a nightclub? Is that not what we do when we party? They have harps and lyres at the banquet and types of timbrels and wine but they have no regard for the deeds of the lord no respect for the work of his hands therefore my people will go into exile for lack of understanding isaiah 5 22 woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks work with guilty uh, for uh, for a bribe but that I just as, excuse me, but that I just as to the innocent. Look at this, drinking wine and champions as mixing drinks. Is that not the same thing that we do right now? This is what the pagans do. People that celebrate idols, that's what they do. Look at what it says in Galatians, Paul, the same thing. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, cleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. These are all things mentioned here that the pagans do the last verse 1 Peter 4 3 for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of Gentiles when we walked in lewdness lusts drunkenness revelries which are parties drinking parties and abominable idolatries this is what these people did this is what the nation of Israel did that's why Paul is making such an emphasis on getting them away from eating foods that are sacrificed to idols. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead, brother. Well, you see them coming just like where the Gentiles are coming the same way that you see them coming, but you're right. And it is the same thing. It's just, your sins affect your generation. It's not like you sin and you sin and you just sin. And the stakes are higher, right? I always talk about, you know, the, the, the sin of, of adultery because that's the stupidest thing that I could do. So I always go to the stupidest thing that I could do. Um, but sometimes when you repeat this a sin in the body, people always say, yo, the pastor's struggling with lust. That's why he's always talking about that. I'm not struggling with lust. I'm very comfortable in my flesh and in my purpose for the Lord and with my wife. If, if I committed adultery, my sin would cause my son, my sons to lose anything. You get what I'm saying? It's not like I'm going to sin and then nothing is going to happen to them. 
right? Osiris is getting married, right? If the Lord allows him and Rasha, they're going to have babies. Like it even affects them. You see, our sin is not isolated. And that's what happened with the nation of Israel, is that that stuff plagued them for, for just out of, out, of this, out of flat out lack of obedience. So then when Jesus came and God made a sacrifice for them because they couldn't keep the law, when you don't listen to God, you're not going to listen to God anywhere. So that, that was their issue. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, God doesn't punish the... There's a couple of verses that you have to read them in context um, where they say different things. But like if I... For my sins, God is not going to punish... If I steal a cheeseburger, God isn't going to punish Osiris for me stealing a cheeseburger. However, if he sees me living a life of stealing cheeseburgers and now I poison that with him and he becomes a thief, then my sin did affect him. So now God doesn't punish him necessarily for my sin. He punishes him for his own sin, right? Like my grandfather drank, my great great father drank, my father drank, like my uncles drank, my cousins drank, like everybody in my family drank. So I'm not going to pay for their sins. It was just me that I started drinking that that was my sinful nature. Amen? We're good? So we must understand that the nation of Israel continued to have difficulty in addition to idolatry. They had difficulty with sexual immorality, idolatry, revelries, which are examples of pagan worship. These are severe issues. So now we move to verse 9, chapter 10, verse 9 in the book of Corinthians. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did. Now it's interesting because it says to put Christ to the test because this is a, a verse where you can see that Jesus is God because... Paul is putting Christ at the same level as the first commandment. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did and then died by snake bites. And don't grumble as some of them did and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Osiris, get that black and white. Is there a black and white screenshot? Um, the Corinthians, they seem to have regarded the issue of eating meat, sacrificed to idols. They considered it a small issue. But it wasn't a small issue because the fact that they wouldn't stop eating the meat, sacrificed to idols, it showed their selfishness. It showed that they were self, they had a self-focused heart, which God destroyed among the nation of Israel in the wilderness. It may be a relatively small symptom, but it was a symptom of great, of a great and dangerous disease. This image right here. You, you, you have to understand this image. This image, Osiris, is it on, on, um, on, on the social media screen too? No? This image with the guy that has the arrow coming. Eddie, you need to know this. This is where we are, okay? According to the Bible, the earth is about six to 7,000 years old. It's not 65 million years old according to the word of God. So these are the prophets, right, in the, in the Bible. This says right here what the prophets saw. So the prophets saw the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. They saw Calvary. They saw the sacrifice. They prophesied this. God showed this to them. They saw the descendants of the Holy Spirit, as you can see in Joel 2, which is the day of Pentecost. But what they, what they didn't see is this valley here. Okay, they saw New Jerusalem. They saw a, a kingdom coming down. So they saw Jesus and they saw the kingdom. Does that make sense? They didn't see this. This is the church age. That's why the Old Testament that I absolutely adore studying never talks about the church age. And it says it right here in parentheses. The prophets did not see this. 
They never saw the church age. They never knew anything about that because revelation comes in generations. Remember, some of the generation didn't go into the promised land. The, I mean, some of the people that came out of Egypt died. Some of the people that were, um, did come out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Some of the people that were in the wilderness went into the promised land. So generations have different revelations. This is where we are. So when you hear uh, the God of this age, right? This is an age. This is the church age. We are in the church age. So we don't know if we're here, 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 here. I mean, if you look at the world, we're probably closer to the revelation of the Antichrist pretty soon. So this is the church age here. That's why when you read the Old Testament, it doesn't talk about that. But the Holy Spirit fell. This is when the church started. And then here's where now God's ark, like Noah, where he's calling his people back before the coming of the kingdom and then the new heaven and the new earth. That's why when people say, oh, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. No, the Bible doesn't say that we die and go to heaven. The Bible says that there's a heaven coming down and we're going to inhabit the earth. So God flooded the earth and he promised to never flood the earth. But that's why the book of Revelation says that the stars of heaven are going to fall and the earth is going to be burned. It's going to be a new, it's going to be burned with fire. Okay. So when scripture talks about the end of this age, like it does in verse 11. Oh, sorry, so we can go to verse 11. Now, these things happen to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. This is the end of the age. We are in a, in a church age where at some point it's going to close. So the church is God's way of, of yo, all aboard, of just calling as many people in. We talked about it this morning. The Bible says that the road to heaven is narrow. And there's a second part to that verse that most people don't say. It says the road to heaven is narrow and not many people are on it. Like I hear that verse and I quiver in my spirit because I'm like, even in the book of Peter, it says the righteous are barely saved. That means all of y'all that are in here that are saved, God is like, yo, even y'all getting in by the skin of your teeth. Imagine everybody else. So this church age is coming to a close that's why all of the things that you see happening in the world, that's what, that's what it is. It's not that these things are happening in the world because they're happening. These things are happening in the world because the kingdom of heaven is coming down. The spiritual realm is shaking and trembling because the spiritual realm knows that the kingdom is coming. It's us that we don't know because we're, we're, we're blind and like sheep we've gone astray. So the spiritual realm knows. That's why there's so much deception in the earth. Because the earth is getting ready to receive its king. And its king is Jesus. And he's coming and we're going to dwell among, among the Lord for a thousand years. We're going to reign on earth and then another series of events. Amen. So that's what Paul means in verse 11 when it says um, that they were written down to warn us at the living, um, uh, those who live at the age. Now um, in verse 12. If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. Paul's telling them, even though you want to eat the meat, even though you're really tempted to eat the meat, don't eat it, please. Eddie, please. We got new people in the church. Okay, I know that you know. Good job. You have a lot of knowledge. Great. You're a great man of God. But please don't do that because we have new believers in the church. And you're like, man, but I'm struggling though. I'm just tempted because they're looking at the food in the market. They're looking at the food that's sacrificed to idols. And Paul is saying, bro, deny yourself, please. I don't, we, you can't cause these little ones to sin because if you don't and these new believers sin, Paul is saying that's on you. Amen. So it's about denying yourself. Verse 14. So my dear friends. Here is the proof that everything that we've been talking about is about idol worship. I've been waiting for weeks to get to this verse. So my dear friends, verse 14, flee from the worship of idols. That's basically what he's been saying. You see the, the vision of Ezekiel seeing the false, the, the priest worshiping idols. This was their issue. It's not a small issue. Verse 15, you are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I'm saying is true. Paul speaks 
explicitly of the idolatry of pagan temples. The, uh, the Corinthian Christians, they may have the liberty to buy meat at the pagan temple at the shop and prepare it in their own homes, but they should flee from idolatry in regard to the restaurants of the pagan temple. You can buy the food from the pagans of the meat that's sacrificed to idols because God declared that the meat was clean. So, yeah, when God declares that something is clean, you can't curse it. So God in Leviticus 11, he told us what animals are clean and what animals are dirty. So he said that chicken is clean. So if I take a chicken and I sacrifice it to Buddha, I can't make it dirty. I can't make something that God said is clean, be unclean. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, bro, they, he didn't even do, you can't curse that. Go ahead. That's okay, the part with the food. So Paul is saying, they, they had markets, like flea markets. Where do you think we get flea markets from? Flea markets are, are pagan. Don't you see when you go to the flea market in Salem, what do you see? Go in there now after you've been in this church for a little bit. Like, we go there to buy the, the Chinese blankets. You know, the, 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 you know what's up, right? The colcha, the colcha. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? It comes in the plastic bag. It looks like a suitcase. You know what I'm saying? It just makes you sin perfect. Um, but... <laughs> Anyway, I get the real thick ones. They're like 50 bucks, but you can't even wash those things because if you wash them, then they get damaged. So you, and if you take them to the cleaners, it's like 40 bucks to clean it. You're better off throwing it away and buying a brand new one. But since I know what's in, that, in the flea market, so when I, w I went there a couple of years ago to, to get a new round of, of colchas, and I was walking through, but it's, now I have information, right? I'm answering your question. I have information now. I have knowledge of the Word of God now, and I'm walking through, and I see all these, you know, the green Buddha. I see all the Buddha. And I see all the, 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 the Santeros and all these Belones and all this stuff. And I'm like, and the Holy Spirit says to me, oh my God. The Holy Spirit says to me, what do you see? And I'm walking and he keeps saying to me, what do you see? And I said, Lord, this is what the pagans did. The Lord said to me, this is what Moses saw in Egypt. Remember, the nation of Israel, that's why the, they have the law. The law of God made them stand out from the other people. You know what I'm saying? The law of God made the people distinct. That's why we walk in the Spirit. So Paul is telling them, when you go to the flea market, buy all the meat that you want. It doesn't matter that it's sacrificed to an idol. Because Paul... Paul only knows the Torah. That's the only thing that he understands. So he's telling them, yo, Paul knows that Leviticus 11 talks about what he can eat and what he can't eat. That's where all of the clean animals and unclean animals are. So Paul is saying, listen, I know that chicken is good. Because God said, that it's good right so if I come not me I rebuke that in the name of Jesus somebody comes and they take a chicken and they take the chicken and they sacrifice it to Buddha and then what's left over they serve it to you will what I thought before we got into chapters 8 9 and 10 I'd be like oh my god I can't eat that I rebuke that or what I would do is I'd be like, let me pray over it. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, I say anything that come into my body. And then I found out that me praying over it is the sin. That's the sin because you know you ain't supposed to eat it. But according to what you believe because your conscience is weak. So God is saying you, you're praying over something because you think it belongs to an idol. That's how significant the first commandment is. That's why the nation of Israel, that's what their sin was. So now, if somebody comes and takes a chicken and then says that the chicken is unclean, Paul is saying, eat what's in the market. Because you already know that it's not clean. It doesn't matter. What about us? God says you're blessed. Nobody can curse what God says you blessed. So we should identify with this truth. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll go into any place. I went into a botanica one day on my lunch break, and I was just like, 
I'm trying to work my own fire. I want to, what, I, what God tells me is true, I want to live it. I want to experience it. You get what I'm saying? I want to walk in there and I want to show darkness. What, what's greater in me is greater than your, your candle. Because I want to fan, the, the Bible says you got to fan your flame. You know what I'm saying? I, take, I took my kids, when we led, me and my old pastor, we led the, the head of the satanic church of Haverhill. Me and my old pastor, we led him to Christ. I became his friend. One day I was talking to him on Messenger and he wrote three books. And I said, yo, uh, fulano, I was like, how did you, where did you get the information to write the books? And he was like, I astral project and I go into hell. He said, the devil brings me to a library and I sit down and he brings me books and I write down the information in the books that he tells me and then I come back and I write it in a physical book. That's my friend. That's the guy I want to be around because I know that he understands the spiritual realm. I'd rather witness to him than to witness to Will or to Eddie in, in front of Big and Beefy. You get what I'm saying? I immediately became his friend. I started trying to spend time with him, took him and his kids to the movies. What happened? I kept witnessing, witnessing, witnessing. And every time I went to his house, I was scared as a mug, boy. Every time I went to his house, he lived on the third floor, and I would go to his house, and I'd be like, hey, Ramabasha, no, Ramabasha, no, 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 no. Yo, I remember one time I was crying so hard. I'm like, Jesus, I'm like, you told me, you told me that I could do this. And I was like, God, you better protect me. I'm in there. I brought my son when, we, when, he, when he was getting evicted. Our church went and cleaned his, his apartment. Eunice and I, we brought a bunch of people from the church, but I brought my son, Elias, and I brought J JV and son. I want to show my kids. Yo, you walk up in that place in the blood of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And we were in his bedroom. I wanted to go into his most intimate place. I want to see the hand of God. Not testing God, but walking in the power and authority that we are given. Do we believe or do we not believe? You know what I'm saying? And we were there and he was we were taking stuff down from the wall. There was one thing that Elias picked up that he turned around. He's like, Papi, what about this? And I was like, ah, boom, and I hit it out of his Yo, I don't know what it was. You remember Elias? I don't know what it was, but when he turned around and he said, "What?" because I told him, I go, you could touch anything in this room. We're prayed over. We're anointed. And when he picked up that thing, I don't know what it was, but I smacked that thing out of his hand, boy. You know, because it's just, it is what it is. Mom. Yeah, he said Christian, what made, him, what made him a satanic worshiper was that he said Christians would make fun of him. And even, and even um, Sister Zuma in her testimony, she said that what made her um, go into the LGBTQ plus community was that um, they were more accepting. Um, all right, let's finish up. Uh, verse 14, so my dear friends, flee from idol worship. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I'm saying is true. Um, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Verse 18, think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? What Paul is saying here is, when you sit down and you have, did I answer your question? When you sit down and you have fellowship, like the Lord's Supper,
right? The Lord's Supper, remember Jesus on the la- which is the Passover meal. We're going to get into it in the next chapter. And they talk about the breaking of the bread. This is my body. When you do the Lord's Supper, that's a spiritual moment. If you come to my house and you sit with me and my family, that's a spiritual moment. Paul is saying, how can you sit down and sit with, with, with people that are sacrificing food to idols? The people, you have a spiritual bond with them. That's what he's saying about, again, we're still talking about food. Verse 19. That's why in verse 15 he says, if you are truly wise... If you are truly wise, meaning, remember the people of Corinth, that's what their claim to fame was, is that they were so spiritually smart that they had all of this knowledge. So if you have all of this knowledge, why are you doing stupid things like sitting at the table with pagan worshipers? Because demons, um, the, the idol itself is not demonic. It's the demonic presence that takes advantage of somebody that's worshiping that. Do not give the devil a foothold. So what happens is demons see you worshiping carved images. There's a doorway for them, for you. So you give them that opening. Um, So though the Corinthians may have the liberty to buy meat at the pagan temple with the shop and prepare it in their own homes, they should flee from the idolatry of the restaurants which had the pagan, uh, from the pagan temple. So what the Corinthian people were saying was, oh, we're good because we know the Lord. We could sit at whatever table. But the thing is, is that if you stick your hand in fire and you don't intend to get burned, it's most likely that you're going to get burned. You get what I'm saying? Like you're not in control if you stick your hand in the fire, what happens? You're not going to stick your hand in the fire and then say, fire, don't burn me. You're not going to be able to sit at the idol at the table with people that are worshiping idols and not have some sort of demonic, um, demonic bond. So verse 19, what am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the, ta- at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. What? Do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Where does this come from? In Leviticus 7, 17, 7, Paul says, they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons. Remember, every time Paul speaks, he speaks from the Torah. That's the only thing that comes out of his mouth. When you capture this truth, you will understand everything in the Bible. That's why when you read in the New Testament, if it's not in the Old Testament, it's not true. If it's not in the Torah, it's not valid. Remember, that's why they didn't believe in the Messiah, the nation of Israel, um, Hermano, Hermano Don Sergio. Because there was no human sacrifices in the Torah. So when the Jews were told that the guy that's on the cross is the Messiah, they were like, bro, we don't do human sacrifices, buddy. What are you talking about? But when John the Baptist saw Jesus, what did he say? He said, look, the Lamb of God, because they knew what a lamb was. You see the symbolism? You see how symbolism plays in scripture? All right, let's wrap up the study. Verse 23, you say, I'm allowed to do everything, but, every, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. That's twice that it says it in this epistle. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Verse 25, so you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. Who believes that in verse 25 means that you can eat any uh, pork, let's say, for example. How do you know? Exactly. So these are verses that cause confusion in the body of Christ that I was led astray, that I learned as I opened the church. When it says these things, you can eat anything sold in the meat. Remember, if I invite you to my house, are you going to open my refrigerator? Probably not. If you're Hispanic, probably not because you got hit for doing that. Even in my aunt's house, I couldn't open the refrigerator. If I invited you to my house, would you go into my bedroom where I sleep with my wife and lay down, I mean, with my wife, and, and um, you wouldn't. But I don't have to tell you not to do that. You just know. That's the same way the, the dietary laws were. 
So when Paul says just eat whatever, just pray over it and eat, it's never against what was already established. You get what I'm saying? Because if he did do that, now you have Paul going against what the Lord said. That's an inconsistency in Scripture. That means that what God said and what Paul said are two different things. And Paul does not go against Scripture. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Does this mean that you can eat whatever you want? Why not, Rasha? Because of the Torah. You see how that causes a lot of confusion? You see why there's so many... It's a standard. It's a standard of measurement. It's a standard of truth. They, Paul never breaks the standard. Look at why you have to keep reading. Whenever you find something that challenges you, keep reading. Look at verse 5 in Timothy. Of, of chapter 4, 1 Timothy 4, 5. Sorry, it was embedded in there. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Food that is sanctified, it's only sanctified in chapter 11. Food that is declared holy. You see what I'm saying? Why you got to just keep reading? What happens is people take a little piece of the Bible and then they go, oh, look at it right here. But it has to fit. It has to fit back in the text. Verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Where does Paul get that from? Verse 26, right there, it says, for the earth is the Lord's, and it's a quote, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Where did he get that from? Exodus 19, 5. Exodus 19, 5, he's speaking right from the Torah. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for the earth is mine. I want to highlight to you moments in the Bible where you have to stop and realize that there's no contradiction so that you do not get lost in the Bible. My passion is to help you not make the same mistakes that I made for eight years while I was reading. I don't even know what I was reading because this thing right here that I learned, I learned that when we opened the church. When I read the Bible now, I almost have to rewash myself from all the filth and false doctrine that I was taught. Verse 27, if someone isn't a believer and asks you, and asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you, this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for your conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person. For why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or to the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I do just, I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. End of chapter eight, nine, and 10. Everything that we just learned is Paul denying himself. You see how bad idol worship was for the nation of Israel? It's so bad that Paul is saying, yo, dude, you guys like, oh my God, stop doing this. Like even stop eating the meat because the meat is like a bridge. You see what I'm saying? Be selfless for one another. That's what Paul is saying. Amen? Amen. Any questions? Let's close in prayer. Kiana, you want to close in prayer?